Welcome to Midlife Matters. I'm Marie, and each week I'm joined by my friends Julie and Mindy to talk about all the topics keeping women in the middle years up at night. Today we're talking about decision making. There are so many choices in our lives, and we all make many, many decisions each day. Do you go with your gut? Look at pros and cons? Flip a coin? Join us as we share the ways we make decisions and how important it is to know how your family members make their choices too. Let's get started. Hi, Julie and Mindy. How are you guys today? Great. Hey, good to girl. see you girls. Doing good. How are you? Good. It's so good to see you guys. I just, I never see enough people during the week. So whenever we can see each other, it's always fun. Yes, for me too. This is a really sweet weekly date that we have together. (laughs) For sure. Well, today we're going to talk about decision making. And if we believe the internet, we've each already made hundreds of decisions today. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the biggest decision you've made this morning? (laughs) Oh, wow. Uh, What to have for breakfast. (laughs) That was your biggest one. All right. So far. I was thinking that probably my biggest one was um, should I react out loud to how I'm actually feeling about this? Or should I use self-control and use kind words? <laughs> that's, if I'm being completely honest, that that was definitely my biggest decision. <laughs> yes. The problem is that I usually just don't use my self-control, don't use kind words. Oh, and then I'm like, oh, why'd I do that? <laughs> but you know, if it comes to a decision, then you have to think about it. A yeah. lot of times I am reacting before I have tried to actually make a conscious decision. So yes, I haven't made any big decisions yet this morning either. But you know, some of the places I read on the internet said we make up to 35,000 decisions a day. I don't know how that's really possible because it was saying there's only, and forgive me for my math, I think it said there were only like 72,000 seconds in a day. So you'd have to make a decision every two seconds. But if you Google it, that figure just keeps coming up and up. But when I tried to find some other studies, it seemed that there were more like 70 to 100 real decisions that we make in a day. Mm. And not every one of them are taxing, but Mm -hmm. there are decisions enough of the time that most of us by the end of the day actually can feel kind of tired of making decisions. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) And why does dinner come at night at the end of that time? (laughs) True. If I was more of a planner, I would already have dinner planned like before we even got to the day or at least by the morning. I know. Me too, Marie. But today we want to talk about what we do for decisions that do require thought. Like, what is our thought process? Um, Are you systematic about your thought process? Are you spontaneous? Do you take your cues from outside sources or do you process internally? And listeners, we would love for you to join us in this scientific quiz that I got (laughs) off a wonderful website called BuzzFeed. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm sure that we've all heard of it. We know that they are on the cutting edge of science. <laughs> Highly scientific. Yes, 100% accurate. <laughs> yes, yes. But listeners and Mindy and Julie, just answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. So how would you, okay, so number one, Mindy, we'll, we'll always have, how about we always have Mindy answer first for these? Okay. Mindy, how would you go about making a decision between equally good things? Would you A, flip a coin, B, consider all the pros and cons, C, ask for everyone's opinions and go with the most popular one, or D, go with your gut feeling? Um, I'll just go with my gut. All right. So you're not even going to consider anything. All right. Go with your gut. I mean, I would ask people, but if they're two good things, then hey, nobody's going to complain about that, right? That's so, true. That's we'll true. just go with the gut. <laughs> Julie, what would you do? I'd probably say go with my gut too. If they're really equally good, then those are hard decisions. Right. Yeah. 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 Thankfully. I will probably consider all the pros and cons because is there really two equally good things? Could they really both be equally oh, good? <laughs> who is a questioner, Marie? <laughs> Gretchen Rubin's quiz just keeps coming back. I know, I know. <laughs> all right, Mindy, how do you make simple decisions like what to have for lunch? You have A, a set routine to minimize the number of decisions you need to make. B, mm-hmm. you go with whatever's convenient. C, you ask for other people's advice, or D, you just do whatever you feel like. 
You know, pretty much I chose A on this. I have a set routine to minimize the number of decisions, especially with a large family. I have found that pretty much I'm going to give people the choices that I'm okay with all of them and then, you know, let them choose Mm because I'm essentially fine with the two or three things that I'm letting them choose from. Right, right. Julie, how about you? Yeah, I was kind of the same on that one, too, because I the things that I buy, I'm okay with that Mm -hmm. I would buy for lunch. And then I just kind of do what I feel like that day and whatever I want. Mm -hmm. I would say the same thing for myself. I only have a few choices in the house and I'm going to pick one of them. There you go. So we've already decided for that, essentially. Yeah. The problem is that I really don't like my choices that I have a lot of times. (laughs) So I'm picking between two equally bad things. <laughs> That's when yeah. you call Uber Eats. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you go out to lunch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How long does it take you to make a big decision? Are you immediate and spontaneous? It can take a while, but I don't like stretching things out for too long. However long it takes, I can mull it over so long, I never come to a decision. <laughs> All right. I'm going with B on this. It can take a while. Um, but I do not like stretching things out. So with a big decision in comes the spouse because I cannot make a big decision for our family by myself since it affects everyone. Well, Bryce happens to be a thinker and also Marie, he is a questioner and a researcher and all the stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, let's get it done. So (laughs) yeah, yeah. Between the two of us, um, it, it takes a little time because we have to come to a unified decision. I have a funny story about this. Okay. Uh, do you want me to tell it now? Sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. We have moved a lot. You guys know this. And we've had to pick a lot of different houses. A couple of houses ago, Bryce finally realized we needed a spreadsheet to help us make the decision faster and easier. Mm. And so he literally built... Um, a spreadsheet ranking our top priorities, like location, house size, yard size, how many bedrooms and bathrooms. So then whenever we would look at a house, we would go in and give it like a five, four, three, two, one, and it would rank the houses. And that's how we've chosen our houses. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And then also the negotiating process can be quite interesting in a marriage relationship when it comes to picking how much are we going to sell our house for or how much are we going to offer on this house? So again, with the house buying, um, we have found in marriage that um, it helps a lot. If we each think of our own number, tell each other, we meet in the middle and that's the number. And we have done that like the last three houses. It has um, gotten rid of a lot of um, stress (laughs) and arguing and because you've got to get two, you know, strong-willed people on the same page about and house buying is difficult. Sure. Well, that's a great way to go about it. (laughs) All right, Julie, how long does it take you to make a big decision? Oh, I'd have to say I can mull over it so long that I never come to a decision. (laughs) Yeah. And if it's a if it's a really big one that I feel like has big consequences. Uh And John will think I've made a decision or maybe Uh even I think I've made one, but then I don't act like I do. You know, Mm. I'm still questioning and rethinking and that drives him crazy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. I say that I probably fall somewhere between however long it takes and I can mull it over for a really long time. Now, if there is going to be a spot where, yes, you had to have made a decision, I will take it up right to the deadline. Right. You know, right. even if I had thought a week ago that my decision would probably be X, I won't pull the right. trigger on it until we come to the deadline because I don't want to be locked in. <laughs> oh, there you go. Keep your options open. Yes, yes. You've gone out for dinner with friends. How do you split the bill? A, everyone pays for what they got. B, everyone pays an equal share. C, I would just wait to be told what to pay by someone who's better with numbers. D, I would just pay a generous chunk and hope for the best. Oh, my gosh. All right, this is really easy. A, everyone pays for what they got. And I would let the server do the the separating of the tickets and then tip him very well. (laughs) Him or her. Right. (laughs) Yes. Amen. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Just it makes sense. I mean, just it does, you know. I go with A, too. That's usually how I prefer to do it. If you couldn't make a decision, which of these options would you choose as a solution? A, choose at random. B, have someone else make the decision for you. C, wait for some sort of, in quotes, sign. 
D, make a pros and cons list. <laughs> um, I would start with the pros and cons list for sure. And then I would actually pray for God to show me. So I guess that's bringing it like I would look for a sign. I would look for him to kind of um, confirm or close the door to something that I was thinking after the pros and cons list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Julie, what did you pick for that? I'd probably say the pros and cons list too. Um, and of course, prayer is in there on all of these. But yeah. um, then I would probably go to John for the decision. Like I wouldn't just ask anybody, but I do. There you go. I do hold him pretty high up on the list as far as right and influence. You know, right on my yeah. decision. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty heavy on the pros and cons list. I like a pros and cons. It works with big and small. Say you can't decide between the, um, you know, gray or the black jeans. You can uh -huh. do the pro versus the con. And it works all the way up to what car should you buy? I mean, it's anything. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There's always a pro <laughs> and con. <laughs> and when in doubt, you can text pictures of the jeans to your friends and they can say yay or nay. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, these questions were pretty lighthearted, but hopefully, listeners, you got a sense of where you land, and then we got a sense of where we land. But uh -huh. we do have some more serious questions for today. So before we even took any of these quizzes, we just wanted to ask ourselves, how do you make decisions? And, you know, maybe some people don't even really know how they make it. It's more of an instinctive thing. So you may mm. have had to take time to think, well, how do I make a decision? Julie, did you have like a decision making protocol? Not that I was conscious of before I started thinking about this topic, but I know that I do like to gather as much information as possible. Like I want to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to think about it and I like to think about it in my head for a while before I present it to anybody. Mm -hmm. It's almost like presenting it to someone is kind of confirmation, right. not so much that I'm going to go solely on their advice. So I think I'm kind of rational and logical, but then I also feel sometimes and those, those are in conflict sometimes. And that's when it gets really hard. Like, Doing what you feel is right, but maybe doesn't make sense on paper. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and prayer is always involved. I'll, I'll say always, but I don't. I don't pray over what to have for breakfast or which store to go to first <laughs> or what jeans to buy. Like I just don't. I know that there are probably people that do, but I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So it's I don't either, the, Julie. <laughs> the, the size of the decision or the seriousness of it yeah. affects the process I use too. Right. right. Mindy, do you have like a decision making checklist mm -hmm. that you kind of go through? I kind of do. Actually, this was nice to write this down for myself to see on paper, because I do have certain questions that I run through in my mind. Um, if it's not just like a an easy, fun, spontaneous decision, if it's morally wrong, is anyone going to get harmed? What's the worst that could happen? And could I live with that? And then the last one really helps me um, in my decision making process. Am I choosing something out of fear and anxiety or do I have freedom to actually make the choice? Mm, so mm -hmm. I think I kind of run through that list in my mind and, and then it helps make it more logical and practical because sometimes a decision can be really big in your mind. But when you run it through the list, you're like, oh, OK, like no one's going to get hurt. You know, mm -hmm. it kind of ranks this, you know, maybe it's not such a big problem anymore. Brings right. it down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's the first thing I say to myself is, well, I don't know that I consciously say these things, but when I was right. ranking like my order of priority, one, is it a moral choice? Okay. No, right. lots of times. I mean, most of the time it's usually not a moral choice. Okay. Then I think what's practical, what could work in a variety of situations and still hold true? What's feasible and reasonable to expect myself or others to do? What would work, what would work long-term? Mm -hmm. And I don't really say those things, but I know I always gravitate towards decisions that are going to be kind of like a principle or right. are going to work long term, not just I'm going to fix this one situation and then the same thing is going to come back in two days <laughs> and I'm going to have to think about it all over again. I'm yes. attracted to more long term solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I usually think about what's the cost in terms of time, money, relationships, mm -hmm. reputation. You know, if I make this decision, how mm -hmm. are these things going to be affected? Mm -hmm. I think, does this decision align with my goals? Like, if I make this decision, is it something that in five years it, it even worked toward 
something I think is important. Yes. Um, And then I do always think, uh, well, I don't always think, but a lot of times I think, well, what do other people do in these situations? And I might look it up or pull a few friends. (laughs) Right. Isn't it funny when you see how someone else feels about something, somehow that clarifies how I feel. I'm either like, oh, well, that's dumb. I would never do that. Or I think, oh, that is so smart. You know, why don't I do that? Yeah. (laughs) Well, now I see why I don't make good decisions or not that I don't make good decisions, but that I have trouble. I don't, I didn't think I thought about any of those things. It's like, wow, there's a lot more to think about. (laughs) Oh, that's funny, Julie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know that I think about them consciously, but I just see over and over again that I am attracted to decisions that touch on all those things, you know. That totally resonates with me, though, Marie, especially the long term effect that you talked about. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, anyways, um, do you like to know all the options in the world or do you like fewer choices? <laughs> uh, fewer choices. Yes. Amen, sister. Yes. I think there's a lot of anxiety in yeah. in having to choose. You know, I was just a good example would be at the grocery. Yesterday I was at the grocery store and I took a picture of the jam aisle. I'll have to show it to you. <laughs> yes. It was almost half the length of the aisle was just jam. Mm. And you love mm-hmm. jams. Too. And I love jam. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I just think that too many choices, since I tend to analyze and want to gather information, I can't know everything about all those jams. Right. Mm-hmm. So how am I going to make the best decision? Yeah. Right. You know? um, it's really not freeing. It kind of, it's kind of, that's a silly example, but too many choices to me is not freeing. It, it kind of paralyzes me. Actually, I totally agree with you. And I'll tell you about a situation that, um, having too many choices actually made me quit something because mm. there I was overwhelmed. Ironically, I was looking to homeschool and there was this homeschool conference coming to town and I had a seasoned homeschool friend that I went to this conference with. Okay. So they, they're telling you all this curriculum of all these different things you could do. And my friend is getting more and more excited and more and more excited. We leave the conference. I'm completely defeated, overwhelmed, Mm-hmm. I'm like, there's, I can't do this. This is too much. And she was like, oh, this is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, this isn't happening. I can't, I can't do that. I can't even pick curriculum. There's too much to, there's no way I can gather all the information on every subject and pick what's best for my child. I can't sleep at night knowing there might be a better curriculum out there for English. Right. I, mean, I could not settle my mind about it. So it didn't happen. Yeah, I like there to be few choices or fewer choices because I know I will need to examine each one at least briefly. (laughs) I'll have to pick it up and examine it at least briefly. And all the choices in the world, I can't examine them all. And so I don't feel like I've made an informed decision. So if you were to observe me in life, I tend to do things the same way or buy the same things. I discovered I liked them. They worked well. They held up well. I'm not even going to look at the other choices. I've already made a decision. (laughs) I mean, why? Free yourself of it. I mean, yeah. 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 Apparently we have like thousands of other decisions to make that day anyway. So you might as well not have to decide again about that thing. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I looked this up and they were talking about like choices at the grocery store or in, or in retail settings and that actually more choices have negative consequences because Uh it causes people to delay choosing. Like they might just walk out and not choose. And a lot of times people are less satisfied with their choices. Uh And they said like the average grocery store has 45,000 products. Aldi has 1400 and Uh they are the ninth largest retailer in the entire world. And they only have one kind of tomato sauce. Oh, (laughs) So I think that just proves that people prefer less choices because you, you're, you're right. You're, you become dissatisfied when you think about maybe all the other things you said. You're constantly thinking there might be something better. Right. Right. Um, And so, yeah, with retail, I do not enjoy going to a large mall. We actually um, lived 15 minutes from the largest mall by square footage up in Pennsylvania. And I never went. However, we were also 10 minutes from an outlet center where I could pick and choose which stores I wanted to go in. And that's where I went like every couple of weeks. Mm -hmm, So it was so much easier. So even, yes, I could see with retail that I would, I'm like, the mall was overwhelming. It was huge. I could walk in there. I would get lost. There was a Tesla dealership in there. It was just too much. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, that would be too much. 
Well, and don't you think your expectations go way up when you have more options? Like, yes, I don't know. Like you, you make a decision and then you're dissatisfied with it. You kind of feel bad. Like, well, because you don't know what you missed out on. You don't know what you left behind on the shelf, you know? Right. Right. But if it was like, if there was only one kind and you were dissatisfied, it's like, well, what else could I do? You know? Right. Right. (laughs) Right. Which later on you will come to know that that is my motto. Or my, my goal is to come to the point where, well, I did all I could do. That's right. <laughs> That's you have to come to a place of contentment and peace. Yes. <laughs> but what is the difference between a hard choice and an easy choice? Because it's funny, a lot of times I have a harder time deciding on small things than on big ones. And maybe it's because with big ones, the choices are fewer. Like, I honestly never wrestled with, you know, how many kids should I have? Or when we've gone to buy a house, I mean, we pick it very quickly, usually because there are a couple few in our price range or the location we want. These are the ones on the market. Pick which one you like the best. Like, I I Uh actually don't really struggle with big decisions the way I might struggle for four days on which computer to buy. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think the difference when I um, thought of that question, hard or easy, I don't think hard necessarily means big and huge. Because mm. like you, Marie, we we bought the first house we looked at here in Nashville. Uh-huh. We joined the first church we visited. Like those decisions just kind of came pretty easily. Uh-huh. But for me, a hard choice is one where one option is really not that much better than the other. Like it is in uh-huh. one situation, but not in all. Right. Like, Actually, no, I scratch that. Okay. <laughs> I meant to say I was agreeing it, with you. I, yeah, I meant to say, okay. The difference for me is an easy choice is when one alternative is better than the other. Okay. But a right. hard choice is right. when maybe one option is better in some situation, but not in this situation. Or, you know, so overall one option is really not better than the other. They're just right. different. Mm. So, and that can happen on small things, you know, like which computer to buy or True. where you're gonna travel or whatever. Um, you know, they could both be good, good choices, but you just have to make the decision. Uh Yeah. To me, it's not, it's not so much about the size. It's, it's about the relationship of the alternatives. Okay. Sometimes I'm like the hard decision is there are no good options. And I'm like, I really just want to like stick my head in the sand and not deal with it. Cause I don't like any of the options. So I'm sorry, reject, give me a new set. You know, (laughs) I'm starting over. (laughs) Yeah. The best of of two bad things sometimes yes. is all you yeah. have. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> when you're trying to make a decision, do you put pressure on yourself to make the single best, most perfect decision? Like, do you think there's only mm-hmm. one option or perfect answer? Mindy, you're shaking your head. I've been proven wrong so many times that there's not one perfect answer necessarily. For, mm-hmm. I think for a lot of things, you know, maybe there are some things that there are, but that's few. Mm-hmm. I think that sometimes um, you can't even perceive some of the options. Like sometimes we limit ourselves thinking there's only one or two options, but Mm. you know what? There could be a third or fourth. And until I've talked to someone or until the Holy Spirit reveals that third or fourth option, the older I get, I try to just let that pressure fall away because I think it's going to be okay. And I go back to my checklist. I go back to the questions that I, you know, ask myself when I run through those. I just try to chill out about it because mm-hmm. you can really work yourself up about stuff like that. I wish I could become as evolved as you, Mindy, because I do put pressure on myself to make the single best, most perfect decision. I uh. I put a lot of pressure on myself to make the best decision. In all areas. Like Steve had to buy a new razor recently. This should not, but I was like, oh, should I send him to the store by himself? I know he's not even going (gasps) to compare. I know he's just going to pick the first one. (laughs) Usually I make the choices in just even the simplest thing like that, because to me, I want to look up, okay, well, these two models, let's look up some reviews on Amazon. Like there's got to be a one right razor. Right. Now, um, fast forward, he did go to the store on his own and he did buy a razor on his own. And I made it a conscious effort to not even ask him one question on how Good he chose or, or yeah. what happened. Because in the <laughs> scheme of things, the razor doesn't matter. But I don't know if I just like decision making. Like, I do like it a little bit. 
And also, I just always feel like, well, there's got to be a right answer. That's just my personality. Because you may not trust that Steve's going to make that pros and cons list that you really like to make and look up all the research (laughs) that you like to do. Oh, for sure. (laughs) He's but gonna see, tell on a razor you. that just wouldn't concern me. If it was my house, it would, but not on his <laughs> right. razor, you know. Right. Well, it didn't concern me enough to go, but I did give thought to should I go and order it or just right. let him pick out his own. <laughs> <laughs> These were electric razors, not just <laughs> yeah, right. let's make that clear to listeners. I'm not that insane. <laughs> right. I mean, but you're wanting it to last for the long term. And that goes right. back to your, your question and your list. Is this meeting? Yeah. Is, is this, this going to meet a long-term goal or am I going to be replacing goal. this in a month? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but Julie, do you put pressure on yourself? Definitely. I tend to think every decision does have a perfect best answer and that if I don't know what it is, I just don't have enough information yet, or maybe I'm not smart enough. Like there's some problem Mm. and that usually leads to putting it off or procrastinating. But I did want to share, I listened to a Ted talk because I just wanted to get some, hear some ideas on different ways people make decisions. And this talk was by Ruth Chang. I don't know who she is, but she had some really interesting ideas on this. And she said, you know, if you tend to think scientifically, you might think that in every decision that one option is either better, worse, or the same. Like those are the only three options. Mm, And she said with things that can be measured, that's true. Like say you need to reach something up in your garage and you need to decide which ladder to get. Well, you know how high the ladder needs to be. So one is going to be better than the other or worse or the same. Like it won't matter. Like you can measure it. But she said with things that have value, you can't put a number on those, you know? So she gave the example of like, whether you should move to the country or you want to stay living in the city. Like that's Ah. a big decision. What am I going to like? Right. And she said, you have to think of those alternatives as just being on par or in the same ballpark, not that one is better, worse, or equal. And then she said, instead of looking for outward reasons that would make one option seem better than the other, maybe this is the chance to say, well, what kind of person do I want to be? Like, be able to create reasons to make yourself into the person who finds country living preferable to city living. You know what I mean? Like, it's Mm -hmm. a chance to change yourself or grow. Like, if every decision just had a easy, no brainer choice, you're kind of going to be a slave. Like you're always going to pick that choice. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, Like with really a lot of thought in it, it's just, that's the one you're going to gravitate to. But when we have to make choices where it's not obvious, we can kind of change who we were, who we are and what we want. And I thought, well, that's a really cool way to look at that. Like, this isn't, you know, this isn't going to define me for the rest of my life or mm. ruin my life. Like this is, I'm not, I'm not talking about moral decisions mm-hmm. here. Absolutely. You know, right and wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I thought that was a neat approach. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. I, I feel like because I've moved so much that has played into that maybe less pressure feeling that I have. Cause I'm like, eh, it's not going to last forever, you know, or things, things change often enough in my life that I'm like, it puts more of a time period or we can all, I know in the back of my mind, like certain things, we can always change that if we need to in the future. Mm-hmm. Or how can I change? You've probably done this. Right. How can you change to make this one work, to make yeah. this option work? I need to adapt. Yeah. Right. I just, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that kind of plays into the uh, question that we had, which was, do the choices you make, do you feel like they identify who you are? Like they say something about you, like the city versus country, I would have to make that decision based on thinking, well, what kind of person am I? Like, who do I want to be? What kind of an environment do I identify with? Or who do I want to be? What's my goal? That's more Mm -hmm. how I would look at that. So when you guys make a decision, does who you are play into it? I mean, if it's a moral issue, yes, I'm going to take a stand for what I believe in. But if it's not that kind of a decision... I do think it it reflects who I am because I feel like people might look at me and s- that, that know me really well would say I would choose the safer choice, like the one with less unknowns. Mm, mm-hmm. But yeah. that says something about who I am, you know, mm-hmm. like it or not. I, <laughs> right. I think that's right. true. <laughs> right. I feel like I have um, a lot of freedom in this area. And this has also changed in my personality as we've moved and gotten older. 
I think that I am who I am. I want the Holy Spirit to continue to work and mold me, but I not really concerned about what people think. <laughs> mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and whereas that used to play a huge impact into how I would make choices. Um, I, if Bryce and I are fine, we're good to go. I, you know, we need to be on board. And even as our kids start leaving the house, um, I've noticed that there are things that may not, you know, Abby or Grant may not agree with. And I'm really like, well, but that's us. <laughs> yeah. I think I went a little smaller with thinking about this question because I was shopping with my sister a couple of weeks ago and we had gone all around the store at home. And there are so many choices That's of things store. that you can buy in there. I mean, from big to small things for your home. And I just, you know, hadn't really seen anything that called my name. And she hadn't either, but we're walking the stores. And then we got to the fall decorations and there's all these fall decorations you can choose from. And I go over and I pick up this pumpkin, this fake pumpkin. And I say, oh, isn't this cute? And it was kind of, I don't know, I can't even describe it. It was like an off-white color. It looked kind of like organic. It wasn't like your typical pumpkin shape. And I don't know. She goes, that is so you. She goes, if I saw that pumpkin on a table, I would think that's the one Marie will pick. And And it was just uh, so funny because even a small (laughs) choice like the pumpkin was like, yeah, that pumpkin to her, just just me picking that pumpkin said something about me and reaffirmed in her mind that that's the one that I would pick. <laughs> that's so funny. That just reminds me of conversations I've had with Abby. And I say this because I have learned that I value people to have their own opinion. Mm. And so with Abby, I know that she would want to please people. And so I kind of almost fight against that or I push her when making a choice of not telling her what I think because I want I value her to have an opinion. Mm. And so I want to celebrate, well, what do you think? Then that's awesome. You know, mm-hmm. especially if it's not a moral decision. It's like right. pick between the genes, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they both look great. Like, what do you want? Oh, I'm not sure. Like, make a decision. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, when we do make a decision, we're saying no to a lot of other things. And, you know, we can kind of get hung up on, well, now I've said no to other people or other jobs or other possibilities. Do you guys have trouble with this? Like, do you ever go back and say, oh, but maybe I should have picked the other one because now I want to see what the other path would have looked like? Yeah, I I do. Like when there's so many options to choose from, I think it's easier. We we mentioned this earlier, like to dwell on all the things that we said no to, the all the attractive features of the things of the alternatives that we rejected. I guess. Mm-hmm. And so all those thoughts can kind of subtract from your satisfaction, even though you might have made a really good choice. But those things are kind of lurking in the back of your mind. Mm-hmm. And I think. I don't know, I think our culture just promotes the idea of having it all. And so it's hard to say no to all the things, you know, that other people, other places that you might live, other jobs, other roads, other possibilities. That's a hard part of the decision making mm-hmm. process. But something I wanted to say back on the perfect decision, I do think that God doesn't expect us to make perfect decisions. You know, sometimes there's endless possibilities and we just feel like we have to get it right and avoid mistakes. But Uh, I'm just reminded that he's more interested in our relationship with Uh him, coming to him and trusting him and that he is going to redeem our decisions and our mistakes. Not that I go into those things lightly and say, oh, it doesn't matter. But just knowing that he can make good out of our mistakes is comforting. Uh Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you said that, Julie, because I I felt like that comes with a little bit of just learning to trust God more. And I'm really thankful that you pointed that out because I remember having to learn that, having to think like I used to think when I was younger, oh, like God will not be happy if if I don't do this right. I didn't say that out loud, but I didn't realize that's what I was thinking. I was so worried about doing everything just right, not letting anybody down and making sure that everything I did was just right. And so having a freedom later to just realize that he loves me. He will tell me. He will shut the door. He will open the door. If I'm communing with him every day and I have a relationship, it's not about what 
I can do right for him. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And things aren't so black and white. It's not like They're path not. A or B. And if once you're on B, then there's never going to A or there's not a C or, right. you know, um, right. that God can create new pathways out of the one you've chosen. Right. You're, you are not more powerful than God that you are going to derail your life in such a way he cannot redeem you. Mm hmm. Well, has your decision making changed as you've gotten older? Because I feel like the things that you're saying about it might have come a little bit with age. And you may not have said those same things with such authority in your voice at age 21. Oh, not, yeah, not one bit, <laughs> not one bit. And, and also, um, I remember actively learning the, um, the basically when you say yes to something that you're saying no to other things. Because in my younger years, I very much was a people pleaser, which is, I think, probably why I see that in Abby and push her to move past it, Um, because that was me, too. And when I had, you know, kid after kid after kid and, you know, the church or community organizations were asking me to volunteer and do things. And I was saying yes and yes and yes, because I didn't want to disappoint people or let them down. And then I was so overwhelmed and stressed at just my own home was so busy and active. I didn't have, you know, I had nothing left. So everything that my kids got from me was mom stressed because she has so many other things to do. And I finally realized like, when I say yes to that commitment, sure, it only looks like one hour a week, but the prep time, the commute time, the mental space that it takes to do it is like six hours a week. And I don't have that to give. Mm, And so mm -hmm. I learned that I was like prioritizing other people over my kids and my husband. And I thought, why did I do that? You know, actively telling myself, if I say yes to doing this, I'm saying no to my family and I'm not willing to do that anymore. And so I did have to actively change and be okay with telling someone else no. Mm Mm-hmm. I think as I've gotten older too, I, I try to consider what other people think about my decision a whole lot less. Like, right. and I'm not saying I've just thrown off sure. all counsel and wisdom, but I consider it. But then the, ultimately the decision is between me and God or, and my family, you know, mm-hmm. um, I, I used to try to please a lot more than I should have because you can't, you can't please everybody all the time. And, right. and there's always a cost to that. Um, mm-hmm. And another way of looking at that, I remember I got some really good advice when I was when I was uh, younger was teenage years was that some decisions you make, you make ahead of time and then you Mm. don't have to make a lot of other decisions. Mm. Right. Yeah. You know, like that was as a teenager, that was a lot about like stands you were going to take and what you were going to do or not do. And you don't need to make the same decision over and over and over again in kind of a high pressure moment, you know, Mm -hmm. like, or where it's really public or where you have a lot of people trying to persuade you, like just make that privately beforehand. And then you don't have to keep come. That doesn't keep coming up over Mm -hmm. and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that has come out like just in raising my family, because sometimes if I'll do something or we'll do something that's like out of the norm, my kids will be like kind of sarcastic, like, Oh, are we those people now? Like, (laughs) <laughs> That's not who we are. Like, I think we do tend to make things. And if we stay consistent in our lives, it does make decisions a lot easier. Um, right. You know, if we just have mm-hmm. overarching principles. Right. It makes the little decisions that come up easier for us. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I remember telling my kids, because, you know, your kids are constantly asking you questions. And there were certain overarching rules we made. Just, you know, like. Listen, if you're asking to hang out with a friend that day, the answer will always be no. You need to give me some advance notice because that takes a lot more time for me to drive you there and plan around it and things like that. So um, there were certain things that rules, essentially, we had to make to function better as a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's talk about one more quiz that I sent Mindy and Julie, and this was out of Kent State, and it places you into four categories depending on how you scored. And so we took this quiz ahead of time, and it basically gives you four categories. So you can either be these kinds of decision makers, systematic slash external, systematic slash internal, spontaneous slash external, and spontaneous slash internal. So basically, 
two categories as far as the first one. You're either going to be spontaneous or systematic. And then your second designation is either going to be internal or external. And when I looked at these, um, they kind of go around spontaneous is kind of making decisions based on what feels right versus Mm -hmm. the systematic one is kind of gathering a lot of information. And the spontaneous person tends to make their decisions quickly. They tend to be able to change course or goals quickly. And the systematic person is much more methodical and kind of goes about things in a slower way. If you're looking at internal versus external, internal, you're going to analyze things silently and privately before you share them with others. You're going to want to, you're basically going to think and then talk. And if you're external, you're going to talk and then think. And you're going to be able to argue about all the different sides of an issue. And you're going to kind of poll people. You'll find yourself wanting to know, well, what do other people think about this? So just in those descriptions, Mindy, what did you test out as? <laughs> Thank you for all of those descriptions, Marie. That has helped me. Um, definitely internal systematic. I'm, I'm totally mental before I'm willing to even talk to Bryce about it. Okay. So yes, that, that, was, that was me. Yes. So just to refresh listeners' minds about that systematic internal would be your Mindy's going to gather a lot of information. She's not going to act impulsively. She's going to be cautious about making a commitment. But and inside, she's going to be analyzing everything silently and privately. She's going to think and then talk. So, Mm -hmm. Julie, what were you? I was the same thing systematic internal. It didn't surprise me. Okay. All right. I'm definitely going to think about it before I talk about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I picture like systematic and internal people as, Mm. you know, they are working on a problem, but they're not going to say anything until it's solved. (laughs) And then you're going to be able to hear what went on behind the scenes. I feel like I don't even know what I'm thinking. It takes some time like to process. I feel like I'm a slow processor because of it almost at the same time, you know, it just depends on the type of decision. So. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I used to feel like something was wrong with me because yeah. it took me so long and I didn't have, because John can make a decision very quickly and he just yes. seems to know all the information immediately. Yes. Um, and I, I just can't do that. And he, and he would kind of expect that from me. And we just had to learn like, no, I'm going to have to get back with you in a few days. Like I just don't right. process things that quickly. And then it's comforting to take tests like this. Cause you know, Oh, not everybody processes things that way. Right, right, right. Right. So how about you, Marie? Well, (laughs) I was systematic external. So I am going to gather a bunch of information, but I think about decisions out loud. I'm going to go through the thought process out loud. And and where I started on it, just because I said that, that doesn't mean where that's where I'm gonna end. This is me externally processing it out loud. And so Uh, When I read the description of that, one of the characteristics with the systematic decision maker is that you're cautious about making commitments, and I am cautious about making commitments. But then externally, I definitely need to talk to other people. It's not even that I'm necessarily going to take their advice, but I need to flesh out all the thoughts on an issue. And Julie, right. you are laughing because you said you have an example of me doing this. And yeah. I, you said it might be kind of embarrassing. So I'm a little nervous. No, I think I'm, you said that. Oh, okay. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> okay. I guess the reason I'm laughing is because it kind of, this was when I didn't know you as well. And it just gave me, I guess, the first glimpse into this aspect of your personality. I think it was probably 10 years ago and you had had family portraits made. Uh-huh. <laughs> And I remember you, you came up to my house, you showed me, you know, these proofs and you said, which ones do you like better? And, you know, when you have five kids, it's like, well, one kid's smiling here, but this kid looks great here, you know, and all that. So she had specifics that she wanted me to look at. And I was like, oh, definitely this one, this one, this one, this one, you know. And then she'd even question, like, are you sure? You know, and I'd say, yeah, you know. And I remember feeling so honored (laughs) that she had asked me. Yes. Well. Then I go, you know, to church and to a party and to a book club or whatever it was. And all of these people had been asked. (laughs) 
<laughs> she had asked a hundred people. So. She'd taken a poll. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I felt so privileged and honored that I was getting to help her select her pictures. <laughs> she was not just going to blindly trust one person. <laughs> I mean, everybody I talked to had seen these pictures. <laughs> I have to gather a consensus. Yes, yes. <laughs> And I just, that just always stuck in my mind as funny. Yes. And I need to do that. Right. <laughs> I hope right. that's not too embarrassing. I don't think it no, is. No, no. It's, it's very, very par for the course. Yes. <laughs> yes. But one, the reason this um, quiz was interesting to me, listeners, is when you are a systematic external decision maker, all of your decision making is kind of on display for the world. So they mm-hmm. can see you going through your checklist. That's very over because you're doing it externally. You're talking it out loud. Like, you know that I put thought into the decision. Now, some of these other categories, I don't know that they put thought into the decision. And Mm -hmm. so I had my husband take the test because we've been married 26 years and we struggle to make decisions together. We'll often Mm -hmm. end up almost always at the same point, But the process Mm -hmm. is a struggle because it turns out he is spontaneous external. So he's just going to look at the problem, assess, and go with something. Mm -hmm. For me, I say constantly, are you sure? Is that really your final decision? Shouldn't we take a little more time? Did you think about this? And in my mind, I'm thinking, I know he didn't think about all the angles because he couldn't possibly have had time. But that has just been something over the years. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I don't I thought I knew what type John was because he makes decisions really quickly and uh-huh. doesn't second guess. But maybe he is more spontaneous because I always think, how can you know that? Like, what have you what have you thought about? What have you considered? Because he just it's so quick. Mm-hmm. Right. I distrust quick decisions. Uh-huh. Even even if, Julie, if I had shown you my pictures and you just quickly say this one, I think, did she even look at them all? Shouldn't she right. have had to deliberate a little bit longer than that? Right. <laughs> well, that in our marriage, that's the same way. I think that Bryce, I didn't have him take the quiz. I would I would label him as systematic external. Um, he's very thoughtful about all of his decisions, very intentional. And since I'm internal, I've had to learn how to talk and tell him that I have actually thought about this. I'm Mm. not just winging it. Like I I really do have an opinion and it's coming from somewhere. So Mm. he had to really learn to trust me that I had put the work and effort that he does value Uh into the decision. And I had to learn how to talk about it. So it is, it is amazing. Like when you look at couples that if you both take the quiz to kind of learn and see where you came from, see, you know, how far you've come, maybe some ways to troubleshoot. Like I said, um, our, our example of how to pick a price to sell the house, he had all this research and I had all this internal research. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And, and he had to trust me and I had to trust him. That's why we just meet in the middle now, because we both know that we're both hard headed about it. And we both have a reason for our number Mm -hmm. and they're never the same at the beginning. Never though. We have found that there's a lot less fighting and stress and all that. Right. We can trust each other and meet in the middle. Like that's the reason we do that. Yeah. And that's true. Like if you don't, if you're not naturally one to talk out loud about your decisions, you don't see the need for it, but that other person does need that. They need to hear that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's hard to do when that's not what you do. <laughs> I was annoyed when he was like, I, I could tell he didn't trust my decision. I'm like, seriously, I have to explain this out loud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But that's so true, Mindy, because my oldest daughter, I know she thinks that I don't trust her decision <laughs> on a lot of things. And, and if I'm push comes to shove, I do subtly question her decisions a lot. But when she took the quiz, she was spontaneous internal. Okay, that is the complete and direct opposite of me. So Mm -hmm. in all fairness to me, I can't see any systematic way she's looking at the problem that would be comforting. I don't get any external thought process from her. So to me, it seems like she arrived at her decision out of thin air. She might as well have just thrown a dart at the wall blindfolded and told me, this is what I'm doing based on where it landed. 
for all yeah, I like could she's trust. just flipping coins. <laughs> yes, in <laughs> right. my mind. But it was so comforting to have her take this quiz and find out, yeah. oh, this is a legitimate decision making category. People can <laughs> make decisions this way and it's okay. <laughs> Marie, like there's people living normally functioning <laughs> lives out there that are spontaneous and internal. I know. Right? <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> so yes, if you want to, uh, one, find out your own decision-making process and two, have better relationships with your family, have right. them take this. I think it's only like 15 or 16 questions and you will learn so much. So I will put a link to that quiz in our show notes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this was very interesting. I know I learned a lot about myself and I hope listeners that you learned a lot about yourselves too. We would love to hear how you guys make decisions. Email us at midlife matters podcast at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram at midlife matters podcast and share if you have any funny stories like Mindy or just ways that you and your spouse have agreed to finally arrive at things or just misunderstandings that you've had with other people. We would love to hear them. But now it's time for I'm a fan. All right, Julie, what are you a fan of this week? I am a fan of something from Costco. Okay. Let's see. It's a brand called St. Michelle Chocolate French Crips. Ooh. And they are delicious. They are in they come in a big bag. Oh, but then yes. there's 20 individually wrapped inside the bag. So you they were great for our vacation. I took them in my backpack for hiking. Uh, I think they're like 140 calories. Yeah. So it's a great little snack and the chocolate, I think it's uh, hazelnut. So it's like Nutella Uh inside. Uh So for the crepes, you don't have to warm them up. You just eat them at room temperature then. Right. You could heat them up and I guess you could make them fancy and put whipped cream and serve them on a plate, but they're also just great to eat in the car or on a hike or something. So if you're on a hike, put it in your back pocket for about 15 minutes, pull it out. (laughs) It's nice and warm. (laughs) Very yep. true. <laughs> <laughs> they are really good, Julie. I have bought those and they, they've they been nice to have like through our move that that was kind of like a sweet treat just yeah. in a bag. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mindy, what are you a fan of this week? Well, we've just moved back to Tennessee a couple weeks ago and I had to have my minivan into the local Toyota dealership for, you know, all its maintenance. Mm-hmm. And um, they asked me the very best question at the end of me t- dropping it off, they said, would you like a complimentary car wash today for your <laughs> I know service? You love those. <laughs> I said, absolutely. Do you know in Pennsylvania, they do not do that? Really? And I was, I felt so bad up there. I was like, aren't like, don't you wash the car? I, <laughs> and they said, no, we don't do that. We don't, we don't have a car wash on site. And I'm like, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> I was just really thrilled and I, it must have something to do with the weather or like the County, you know, with car washes or something like that. Mm-hmm. Cause we had a hard time finding car washes anyway, but now I was so thrilled today. I got a free complimentary car wash after my oil change. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I do like to get a car wash, even though I don't get a, my car wash often, it does make you feel yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm a fan of something that kind of goes along with having to make less decisions. So I was on Instagram and I rarely fall for advertising. Unlike Julie, who said many times that when she sees <laughs> something on Instagram, she'll buy it. But I saw this little ad that said, get a free Amazon smart plug. And I know those are like $25. And before I clicked on it, I read some of the comments and it said, this link actually does work. So I thought, all right, I'll click on it. And you only had to pay the tax and you got one free Amazon smart plug in the mail. Okay, what is a smart plug? I don't even know what that is. Okay, a smart (laughs) plug, an Amazon smart plug works with your Alexa. So I got an Alexa for my birthday. Theoretically, I could say, Alexa, turn off the living room lights. And she would turn them off or she would turn them on and I wouldn't have to go around and click them. Yeah. And I plugged a couple lamps into the one smart plug. Well, I loved it so much that I then I think it must know what you're um, easy to fall prey to. So then it showed me this other one, Casa, K-A-S-A, smart plug that I actually like even a little bit better. So I want to share it with listeners. I'll put a link in the show notes. And now I have four of my lamps downstairs 
on timers. And I love it because my living room is kind of dark. And when I wake up in the morning, it's already set to come on at six. So even when I come Mm. downstairs, the light is already on and it goes off at 11 after I've gone to bed. So the light's on the whole time. Mm. I could shut it off just by pressing a button on my phone. Like if I'm upstairs now at 930, I know I'm not going back down if I want to shut it off. It's just really cool to just be able to turn your lights on from and off from one location or they can just be hands free. You never think about them. Uh, mm-hmm. This will be great when I have a Christmas tree because I hate getting yes. down on my hands and knees and crawling under the Christmas tree to unplug and plug the tree in. You can just set it or say, Alexa, turn on the Christmas tree. Yeah. I'm totally asking for this for Christmas. <laughs> I have lamps in every room, multiple lamps. I love indirect lighting mm-hmm. and I literally could spend 30 minutes turning them on and off. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it just cheers me up. And and when they're not on, I feel kind of dreary, but I'm thinking, do I want to get up and turn all the lamps on? This right. way I just say, Alexa, turn on the living room lamps. Yeah. Like when it's an ordeal, you're tired to go to bed. You're like, oh, I have to turn off all the lamps. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So anyway, oh, mind that it, she's gathering all kinds of information I'm on like, you. Well, that's why if you don't want to do Alexa, you can get the Casa one. K A S A. She is not that one is not hooked up to Alexa. She's yeah. not paying attention to you like Alexa is. Right. That one is just controlled by your phone, your which phone, is why yeah. I said that I like it kind of a little bit better because I don't okay. even have to talk. I don't have to oh. say anything for my lights to go on. Love it. I can just that's... set the timer or I can just turn them on on my phone. <laughs> Love it. All right. I can't wait to follow that link that you're going to post. <laughs> Definitely. And let me just, out of curiosity, see what I paid for these Casa Smart Plugs. $14 for two. That's totally worth it for all the pleasure I've already gotten. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, listeners, uh, we loved talking with you guys today. I would love to hear your answers to the quizzes. We want to know how you guys make decisions. Mindy and Julie, I feel like I know you a lot better now that I know how you make decisions. And Julie, you know, you don't have to feel super honored when I ask your opinion. <laughs> but you do have to give me a well thought out reason for your opinion. I have to I have to talk about it. I need reasons. <laughs> we need to hear your thoughts out loud. Yes. Yes. Okay. Listeners, this is why maybe sometimes you'll see a poll on Midlife Matters Instagram. Which one do you like better? I'm trying to gather opinions. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, Mindy and Julie, we will talk to you later. All right. Sounds great. Okay, bye. 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 We're so happy you joined us today. You can find the show notes for this episode at midlifematterspodcast.com. Also, please tell a friend about the show and help them hit the free subscribe button on their favorite podcast app. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Midlife Matters Podcast. That's where we post pictures and stories about all the things we talk about in each episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.